Oh, thank you, Ellison. I love that. It's Philippians chapter 1. I have a uh, pet annoyance that it, with the NFL. Well, besides the fact that the Steelers are no longer playing this season, that would be my greatest pet annoyance. But there's another one, and that is all too common the we, you have a, uh, a running back who runs two yards into the end zone and then dances for 30 seconds. That bothers me. It bothers me partly for the linemen who opened up such a hole that I could have run those two yards myself, but this lineman who ignored the guy in front of him and went unsuspecting to the other guy and laid him on his back, the running back goes in and acts like they just uh, took Normandy. Am I right? Is that not a little annoying? See, there's fundamentally a problem happening there, and that is they feel as though it was them. It's all them. And in life, we feel that way for the positive and the negative. The weight of life is so heavy, I'm not going to be able to handle this, where the coach looks at you and goes, I, I don't know what you're talking about. I've got the game. You just do your part. And that's no offense. It's not just to the center or the placeholder. It's to the running back. It's to the quarterback to say, no, you're a part of a bigger picture, and we have a coach. The bigger picture of your life, there is one. And the circumstances that are happening in your life right now that you don't like are part of the story. And you're not going to understand it. You may never understand it, but the coach does. In fact, the game's already won. I mean, the scriptures are full of that. The game's already won. We've already won. And yet we struggle every day with relationships or circumstances or an uncertain future. We struggle with all of this as if it has us down. No, today what we're going to do is we're going to talk out of Philippians and say, keep your head down, do what you're supposed to do. You just carry through with your task, and we're going to leave the rest of it up to the Lord to handle. See, Philippians, written from a really dark place, Paul under a house arrest with no idea what was going to happen to him. He didn't know, actually, that he was going to be set free, and he was for a season, imprisoned again, and then executed. He didn't know the timing. He kind of saw it coming. But we're seeing this written from him, a subject of joy. There's four chapters in Philippians. It's dominant through the entire book. The first chapter is the joy of Christ and Jesus in life. And then we see through the chapters, it continues on. We see in chapter 2, Jesus is our example in humility, in joy, in suffering. And then we see in chapter 3, again, it's Jesus. He's our goal in our joy. And then the fourth chapter, he's our sufficiency. It's all going to be okay. But not blindly. We say that around the house. Something happens uh, with the kids, and, and I'd, say, I'd say, well, you know, it, it's going to be perfectly fine, whatever that situation is. Don't worry. I've, I know it. And they go, really? I said, no, actually, I don't know. But false hope is at least hope. And they go, oh, thanks. No, I don't know if that's thanks or not. Well, no, Jesus really is our sufficiency, and I'm saying that it is really okay when He is our central target, He is our focus, then it really is okay. By the teachings of the Bible, yeah, but by example too, where Paul said that. You don't have it as bad as Paul did and he says, no, it really is okay. I'm fine because my focus isn't on all of this. My focus is on him. 
Now, that sounds real churchy. I'll admit, that sounds like we're supposed to say things like that, but let me explain how practical it is because we're sending a message to our kids We're sending messages to our grandkids of where contentment really is found based on our reactions. When your life is just ruined because of the loss of somebody or the loss of a job or something, kids watch that. And they also will experience the same type of tragedy that you're experiencing Because the message is, I'm not going to be okay because I lost this person. I'm not okay because we're out of money. Then the emphasis is on, I'm going to make sure I keep everyone in my family safe and I got to make sure that my job's okay and that money's coming in because my life's contentment and joy is contingent on it. It's not true. Watch where it is. Watch what the message is that we send to our family members and friends as far as where joy is found. And so in the middle of all of this, if you didn't know what Paul's circumstance was, you would have had no idea. You wouldn't have guessed it. Because he actually was okay. He actually had a piece about him where literally, if you're listening to my voice online and you're in a prison cell, you're not less likely to have a contentment in life than if you're listening in a big house. Because it's inside. And nobody can take it away from you. But they can take your job away. People can leave you. People can die. They didn't want to leave either, but they're gone. And somehow, I think it's one of the greatest successes of Satan is to convince the believer that there is such thing as a plan B for your life. Because of something you did or something that happened to you that now I'm less than what I was ever meant to be, and I'm less than somebody who didn't have that happen to them or that they didn't do that. That is not true. There are certain areas of, of Phoenix that <clears throat> they're relatively safe to drive um, during the day quickly, you know? They're okay. At night, maybe a little different. That's true here in Pittsburgh. There are certain places anywhere in Pittsburgh at, at night that you shouldn't uh, be in. And you know that area. It's the area between the rivers. Okay. The, um, it's like Gotham. Some of us have driven ourselves in our life to a wrong side of town. You've put yourself somewhere that you really weren't expecting to be, and you did it by making some bad decisions. Okay? Let's just get that out on the table. There are some listening to me that happened. And now you're in an area that you didn't expect to be. You really didn't think that you would end up on this side of town. Plan B. No, there's a point in which we have driven ourselves to an area of life because somebody did something, because we did something, we said something, and here we are, we're off to this bad area. The moment in which we say, you know, Lord, it's not my life, it's yours. For me to live is Christ, to die is gain, and we scoot over and we give him the steering wheel of our life. The moment you do that, it's plan A. Oh, you're still on the bad side of town. I mean, if you, they're stealing tires off your car while you're moving. I mean, that's how good they are in this side of town. I mean, it's, it's a bad side of town. But while you're there, if he's in control, it's okay. It's God's sovereign will. You and I can never look ahead at God's sovereign will and know what it is, but we can look backwards and see it. It is the way it is. Did he allow it? Did he orchestrate it? Play those games all day long, but where you are right now is where God has you. 
And as we surrender ourselves to God through faith in Jesus Christ, you are plan A. I don't care what anyone else says. What else did he want from you? He wants you. He's always wanted you. Yeah, but I can't serve him like I used to because. Why, he needs that? He can get someone else to do it. He can always get someone else to do it. But there is no replacement of you. You, in a healthy relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ, regardless of what you've done, where you've been, that's where God has called you. So we keep our head down, and we leave the details to him, and he breaks into a section in chapter 1, verse 27, and I'm going to suggest three things that you and I can focus on. Regardless of everything else around us, your uncertain future, those relationships that are crazy going on in your life at work or family, three things you could focus on. Take a look at the first part of verse 27. Talked about being alive in Christ, the joy in Christ. In verse 27, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. All of this going on. Piles of stuff and stories and drama. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. There's your job for today. Keep your head down. That's what you're to do. Your life worthy of the gospel of Christ. It's a very familiar phrase for Paul. He's used almost the exact same phrasing he did in Ephesians, where he's talking about your, your life is worthy of this. This is your calling. You're in Christ. You're a child of God. Live like it. Think for a minute, called by God, relationship with Him through faith in Jesus. Live a life worthy of that. So, we simply look around and go, what is it about me that really isn't as stately as a child of God would be like? The conversations in the hallway at school. Yeah, probably shouldn't be talking like that. That, that doesn't really present itself at the level of worthiness of a child of God. I need to be back out of that. It might be locations, certain places you go, certain people that you spend time with. They're your confidants. Uh, maybe they shouldn't be. I don't, since, I don't know how long, since I was little, I've always done one dumb thing that I always thought was funny at, uh, at the dinner table. And there's a few things that I've told Sarah, I will stop doing it when people stop laughing. And so she's tried to set it up where she'd tell everyone, okay, he's probably going to do it. Please don't respond. Well, I wait until there's somebody new. And so I'm eating, and I'll put a piece of food, something significant that'll stick, like on the side of my face. And I go, I'm sorry, do I have something on my face? And they go, uh, yeah, right there. And I go... They said, no, the other side. And I'll do everything but leave the one thing. So inevitably, the family just rolls their eyes. They're like, dumb routine. It's never been funny. New person, obligation maybe. I'm fine with that. Laughs. Well, Ross does it now, doesn't he? So I've, it's on to a second generation. I can almost give this up because Ross, he's 21. He'll do that with his girlfriend. They're eating, and he's just got a big old something stuck on his face. And I'm like, that's my boy. That is my boy right there. I'm so proud. I'm laughing. She doesn't laugh. I'm like, boy, I'm with you. That was good stuff. It's right here. And he's like, where? I'm like, yes, keep going. Keep it going. This is an odd thing about something, an area of your life that's unworthy 
of the gospel of Jesus is that it's that obvious. I want to suggest that it's that obvious to other people. So we'll sit and we'll go, okay, I'm going to think of something, an area in my life that is unbecoming. It's not really of the standard of the gospel of Christ. And we go, let me think. No, not much. I'm pretty good. And it's like we've got this stuck on the side of our face. And we're like, it really is that obvious. If we ever had the courage just to go to somebody and say, hey, if you see an area in my life that is a bit unbecoming, it's not really in the category of a real good fool imitation of Jesus. Could you think of anything? You're going to watch the person that you ask, especially if it's like a spouse. They're going to go, hmm, I don't know. Nothing really comes to mind right off the bat. And what they're doing is they're prioritizing categories. they got categories going in their mind at that time. They're, they're like, oh, yeah, that, well, that's too obvious. No, that one, well, that one drives me nuts. You do that with a friend. Sit with them over a cup of coffee and literally just, just do it for the fun of it and say, hey, I'm just curious. If there's an area in my life that, that you think needs work that is not really fully worthy of Christ, Could you think of something? It's worth just to see the look on their face. Because they're like, okay, and this is what they'll do. I know what they'll do because I've done this. They punt. Oh, yeah, we all do have areas of our lives. And I really, I just really can't off and think of one right now for you. And they're thinking, dear Lord, please let this conversation end right now. And then you say, yeah, take a minute then, think about it. And they go, oh, no. They're going to make me say it. Because it really is that obvious. There is something. You're highly judgmental or critical. You, you push people down. You're not encouraging at all. Maybe that's it. And you're like, oh, no, I'm like the encouragement bunny. I just keep going. All right, that's good. That's good. Is there a habit? Is there a conversation? Is there an inactivity? As believers, we spend a lot of time just about ourselves and our lives when there's a lot to be done for the cause. Is that what it is? Well, unless we can find it and name it, we'll never fix it. So I'm not like trying to be difficult with any of us today, a little bit, because it's fun. I'm not even saying get rid of it. I'm saying just name it. What is it? What is it about you that's unbecoming, that's not worthy of the name of which you've been called? You're a child of God. What is there about you that you say, you know what, enough of that. I'm not going to be that way. I'm not going to talk like that. I'm not going to be that. I'm not going to go there anymore. I'm not going to spend my hours doing that any longer because it is just a step down from the calling of which I have. It's not worthy. fun to move to a second point, isn't it, to get off of that one? But unless we can name it, we'll never have it to, to work on. Look at the next one. It continues on in the verse. Only let your man worthy of the gospel of Christ so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. Striving for the faith of the gospel. We have a cause as a church. 
The cause is not that we simply come in joy. And worship was nice this morning. Thank you, the team that put that on for us. You, I know you guys work throughout the week. Thank you for that. We come together and we enjoy a service, not just so that we move on. It's we're actually joining together in unity for the cause of the gospel of Jesus. That's, that's what we do. We stand in unity, as the text says, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. Well, if you have that as the target, shouldn't we be able to actually gauge its success or not success? If we gather so that we can encourage one another in the faith of the gospel and promote the great story of Jesus to others, shouldn't there be evidence of that? Individually, we're called to participate as members of this body of Christ to see that the gospel of Jesus Christ is promoted. It's unity in the gospel. I've heard it said that there's different goals of the church. We have, a, we have a goal that we need to live and encourage and body life and enjoy each other. That's not a separate goal. There is one goal. Ultimately, it's to bring glory to God, and we bring glory to God by seeing people come to know Jesus. That's what we're about. And the other good things that we do are steps to get us to that. So we want good body life. Wednesday night, those of you that are coming Wednesday nights, 6.30, I think it's a lot of fun. I hope you're enjoying it. It's a good crowd on Wednesday night. Did I mention it's going to be more fun this Wednesday than it was last Wednesday? Okay? Yeah, see, thank you for the honesty there. Um, It was a little uh, little challenging. The, uh, The snacks were good. Am I right? Yes, so snacks are good. That's how you gauge the success of an event. Snacks. Temperature was right. You could have left any time you wanted, technically. been awkward, but you could have. Uh, this week will be a good one. On, uh, still, it, we're in Proverbs, and this will be more lively. I think you'll enjoy it this Wednesday. Body life is important. But we're coming together for body life, not as an end in itself. We come together to learn in God's Word, to enjoy the fellowship and the body life together, moving towards our goal, which is we stand side by side for the faith of the gospel. That's why we exist. And too often, we'll actually settle with a lesser goal, which is as long as we all get along and we can start seeing some new people and we have good body life, that is like successful all on its own. No, it's not. It's steps towards. William Booth founded a Salvation Army, as I think you know, is a long time ago. Uh, you can actually find uh, audio of him. Did you know that? You can actually listen to a sermon of his uh, audio. Um, so if you Google, I think even Salvation Army may have it on their site. They should. But early on, he had a motto, and it was, a, it was on his Salvation Army there in England, and it was Soup, Soap, Salvation. Because it helped clarify what they were about. Soup, soap, salvation. The goal is to see people come to know Christ. We're getting to this point because we are giving people food to eat. We're giving them clothes to wear and to be clean and shelter. We're giving them all of these things. They're not separate goals. They're all working towards salvation. And probably the history of Salvation Army, you could probably see when they focus too much on soup or soap. And all of a sudden, the salvation ends up a moot point. Location to location, I bet you that's true. Same with the church. What do they say? The enemy of the best is the good, and we can settle for the good, and we've missed the point. 
It is that we are standing side by side, cooperating together for the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'd made quite a few trips to a little island of Tobago. It's Trinidad, Tobago. You can actually see Venezuela from there on a clear day. Uh, It's that far south in the Caribbean. I was working with a couple churches. They were Anglican churches, and we were talking about the gospel. It's all we were working on is training in the gospel. How do you share it, and how do you lead with it? And I met up with one of the pastors, uh, Father uh, Isaac. I met at one of his churches, and he walked in with his Book of Common Prayer, which is their liturgical book on, um, on how to run services and what to do in the Anglican church. It's the Book of Common Prayer. He came and walked in, and he handed it to me. And he goes, look. And I grabbed it, and it looked like one of those books. It looks like some of your Bibles. Every page was written in. He's got highlights everywhere, and he's got things marked, and it's just a worn-out book because he's been a uh, pastor at this church for a very long time. So he hands it to me, and he goes, look, just flip pages. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, okay, this is a you're a good hard worker. I'm like, I don't get the point. Um, good for you. This is excellent. You, you own pens. I like this. And he goes, no, 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 no. Look, Jesus is on every page. And I'm like, yeah, he is, isn't he? And he had this revelation about himself of those two weeks that we were there where one day it just clicked. And to hear him say, and I'll never forget it, where he said, I used to teach Jesus as a significant subject, but one of a hundred subjects. He goes, but look, he is the subject. And I'm like, ah. I'm not going to argue with you. He goes, no, he's everywhere. The subject is death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ available to all who believe. He goes, there's the message of the church. And I'm like, preach it, Father Isaac. I love it. And he goes, we've been there, but we weren't there. He goes, I see it. I see it now in my Bible. I see it now all over this book of common prayer, and it's a revelation. And it's not only a revelation for us as a church to be constantly reminded of the fact we exist to see people come to know Christ, be discipled in their faith, to lead other people to Christ. That's why we're here. It's not just so that your life is better and that you get to grow in your faith. I love that. I hope your life is better because your joy is more found in Christ. And I sure do hope that you're doing great in your growth in Him. And I want all of those things, but they're not in themselves. They're so that we are more healthy, we stand firmly and side by side with our ultimate purpose, which is to see people come to know Christ. There it is. It is the subject. As a church. And ourselves. Based on your personality, don't overcome your personality. Based on your knowledge and the setting in which God has placed you, We're to be telling people about Jesus. That's what we do. We tell people about Jesus. And if your way is to invite them here and have me do it, then do it. I'm for every way that shares the gospel. But you're not coming here just to help us as a place be more about the gospel, we as a place are helping you with you sharing the gospel with places that you go that this church will never go. I'll never sit in those meetings or those classrooms or those team uh, meetings, locker rooms, that I'll never be in any of those. This church will never be mentioned in any of those. But you're there. And as you walk worthy of the gospel, 
keep your head down no matter circumstance, and then you also participate side by side, cooperate with the message of the gospel. Well, Paul had already said that. He said, here I am, stuck in this prison, and it was a jail, it was house arrest, but he had his own personal guard. He had to pay for it for two years. And he just said this in chapter 1. He goes, yeah, but look at the people who now, including guards, who now know Jesus. Because he's placed where normally the gospel would not be spoken. And he figures out a way to say it. Here's a third one, and it's in some ways kind of unrelated. It's in verse 28. I'm encouraged by it, though, and I think you may be too. When he says, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel and not frightened in anything by your opponents, this is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. The one thing that you and I can do for our Savior here that we're not going to be able to do for all eternity is suffer for him. You're not going to do that for eternity. This is the only time. So things are happening. I have no idea why you get redirected. I have no idea why the makeup of your family is the way it is. I don't know any of those things. And a lot of it hurts. Decisions that were made long ago are still affecting you today. I know it hurts, but we suffer for his sake. We keep our head down. We want to walk worthy. We want to have a uh, cooperate with the gospel, and we also want to confidently walk the rough road of suffering along with him. There's a character that I, I really like. Um, he's not real well known. His name is William Cooper. It's C-O-W-P-E-R. William Cooper lived a long time ago, and probably his greatest claim to fame is that he was like best friends with John Newton, who wrote Amazing Grace. John Newton was a real character. He was a real well-known. Then there's William Cooper. William Cooper, not so much. William Cooper would be, I'd consider him dark. He had, he had this dark, depressive, kind of Winston Churchill referred to his darkness as uh, the black dog. I don't know if any of you have read that, where he would be, Winston Churchill, perfectly fine in meetings, and all of a sudden he said the black dog came in the room, and that just means he's just overwhelmed in darkness and sadness and depression where he could barely function. That was Winston Churchill. William Cooper, probably his best friend would not be John Newton. It'd probably be the black dog. And not for, not for no reason. His mother died when he was a child. His father sent him to boarding school. He had many attempts of suicide, times in insane asylums and certainly of the day. We can go through the losses in his family and other things. It was just a an overall tragic life. He did write this song, um, uh, John, the old uh, hymn, uh, There's a Fountain Filled with Blood. That's, uh, that's William Cooper, and I think most of you would know that song. Who wrote, His purpose will ripen fast, unfolding every hour, the bud may have a bitter taste, but sweet will be the flower. It may hurt right now, but there's a reason. His purpose will ripen, 
it does unfold. It is bitter. But sweet will be the flower. If you're going through a really hard time, I want to encourage you to, well, first to reach out to somebody. I'm around all week. Others who would love to hear you. You don't need advice. You just need someone to listen. Because you're hurting. You may not even know why you're hurting. Maybe it's that black dog is in the room. Maybe that black dog regularly comes in the room. But it's the encouragement to know that suffering is a part of what we're facing in this life. You will suffer. And it will hurt. And it'll... Am I right? Where you, and you don't really see it coming. You didn't think it was going to be there. You didn't think that was going to happen. I wish it could be predicted. It's part of the suffering is that it's not predictable. Barry Sanders. Do you guys remember of watching Barry Sanders? Okay. I'm bringing up Barry Sanders, the great running back Detroit Lions, who didn't ever get to enjoy Thanksgiving with his family for 11 years because they always played on Thanksgiving. He was one on 99 touchdowns. That's how many he scored. It's sixth most in all of the NFL. He was one that would score, and what did he do after he scored? Does anyone know? That's it. Hand the ball to the referee. In fact, he didn't even flip it to him. He didn't toss it. He actually handed the football to the referee. I read an article recently where he explained that when he was playing a kind of peewee football, that he had watched Tony Dorsett, and, and he was just real little. He watched him on TV and saw kind of a bit of a dance in the end zone. And in Pee Wee football, he did it. He kind of gave kind of, kind of fun something going on. He got in the car, and his dad said, you probably thought you were kind of cute there in the end zone, didn't you? Uh, yeah, Dad, I thought that was kind of cute. It's like Tony Dorsett. He goes, Yeah. And if you ever do that again, we're not playing football. And according to, according to uh, Barry Sanders, from that day on, he scored, hands the football to the referee, and walks away. This is the other thing that he said, was he would tell young players, he goes, he goes don't score a touchdown, touchdown as if you've never done it before. Score it like you do it all the time. It's just another day, another touchdown. Here's the football. There's something about you and I getting a larger picture and getting our head down. There's a lot to understand and know in the Christian life. God is doing things locally and across the world that I'll never understand, ever. He is active in places. He is active in places in this world that I'll never know about. But one thing I do know is I need to walk in such a way that is worthy of my calling. And you do too. Easiest thing is to think of something. Something to focus on. Something to hand over to the Lord. To walk and strive side by side for the gospel and also to suffer for his sake. Let's pray together. Let's pray together. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, I would pray you do today. You can offer yourself to the Lord right now and just say, Lord, my life is yours. I trust you for eternal life. And for all of us that we'd say, Lord, reveal an area of my life that needs work. Graciously move me to live more of a worthy life. And for those that are suffering, dear Heavenly Father, we commit those that are suffering today, barely made it here today because of life and struggles, that you would encourage. 
you would direct all of our eyes to you because we trust you with every aspect of our life. You're our coach. You have this. Thank you. We can rest with you as control of our life, plan A, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.